Hello, everyone, and welcome to MSK Unknown Case Series, case number 44. Here we have an axial T2 fat sat image through the shoulder and a sagittal T2 fat sat image through the shoulder showing some abnormalities that you should uh, pay attention to. And the question that I have for everyone here is the findings seen are suggestive of what prior diagnosis? An anterior dislocation, adhesive capsulitis, multidirectional instability, or septic arthritis. And I want to come back, you know, because I think the sagittal is also telling for, you know, what we're trying to see here. Um, so what prior diagnosis do they have between these four? And of course, the answer here is an anterior dislocation, the anterior glenohumeral joint dislocation. Now, currently, the shoulder is not dislocated, right? It's certainly not dislocated. But, you know, if we come back to this image here, we can see that there's a defect along the posterior lateral humeral head on along the axial image. We call that a hill sax lesion. And along the anterior inferior glenoid, there's a Bankart lesion, right? And we'll discuss why that's the case. But this suggests that because of this pattern of injury, this patient must have had an anterior glenohumeral joint dislocation because those are the characteristic injuries <laughs> that we see in anterior glenohumeral joint dislocations, right? You know, adhesive capsulitis is typically seen when you have obliteration of the fat within the rotated interval. So on a sagittal T1 weighted image, that space between the supraspinatus and subscapularis, uh, the rotator interval, which normally has fat, that fat will be obliterated. You may also have thickening of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, you know, you know, thickening of the axillary uh, recess. All those are findings of adhesive capsulitis. Multidirectional instability would mean we get findings of both anterior and posterior dislocation. So maybe, you know, a hill sax lesion, but a reverse Bankart lesion, something like that, right? Something to suggest that instability is not just in one direction, but in, you know, various directions. And of course, septic arthritis would present with, you know, full bone infection, you know, subchondral erosions, maybe a complex joint effusion, uh, bone marrow edema on both sides of the joint. You know, certainly we don't see that here, right? So the best answer here would certainly be an anterior dislocation. I wanna talk about this because I showed it to you in a way, usually you're used to seeing this on a plane film, but I wanted to show it to you on an MRI to challenge you and to show you what the characteristic findings are on an MRI. Now, of course, this is the most common type of shoulder dislocation. 90 to 95% of shoulder dislocations are anterior glenohumeral joint dislocations, usually a result of trauma, right? Now, 5 to 10% of them typically are posterior, and those happen from seizure histories or electroconvulsive therapy, right? So, you know, not always related to trauma like an anterior one. I see anterior shoulder dislocations on a weekly basis. I may see a posterior one on a seasonal basis. That's the difference in its incidence, right? So, you know, we have characteristic findings in anterior shoulder dislocation that I kind of alluded to. So you typically have a hill sax impaction injury along the posterior lateral humeral head and a bank heart lesion along the anterior inferior glenoid, right? The bank heart lesion can either be labral or osseous, meaning that the anterior inferior labrum can be torn, but the bone is not broken or contused, or it can be a frank osseous back heart lesion where not only is the anterior inferior labrum torn, you know, there's a bone bruise or an injury to the anterior inferior glenoid, which is an osseous structure, of course. And I want to show what this looks like on an x-ray, right? This is probably what you're used to looking at, right? So if we look at this image on the left side right here, this is a frontal view of the shoulder here. And we can see that the humeral head is inferiorly medially displaced with respect to the glenoid, right? This is the humeral head. This is the glenoid. It's not articulating with the glenoid. This is what a characteristic shoulder dislocation looks like, right? This here is the hill sax lesion, right? The posterior and lateral aspect of the humeral head impacts right here along the anterior inferior glenoid. And that's why you get the characteristic lesions, right? You get the hill sax impaction injury along the posterior lateral humeral head, and you get uh, the, uh, excuse me, you get the bank card lesion along the anterior inferior glenoid, right? And if we took a, take a look at the scapular Y view, right? This is a scapular Y view because the scapula looks like a Y, right? The two prongs here, the acromion and the clavicle form the two prongs of the Y and the base here is a scapular body. This circle here is a glenoid. This humeral head should be sitting right on top of this glenoid. If it was if it was normally located in a normal situation, right? This humeral head would be superimposed on this circular glenoid. But the fact that the humeral head is under the coracoid that indicates this is an anterior dislocation because the coracoid process of the scapula is an anterior structure. If the humeral head were sitting right here under the acromion, that would be a posterior dislocation, right? Because the acromion or the acromion process of the scapula is a posterior structure. So the humeral head should be sitting right here along the midline, 
right over the glenoid. If it's under the coracoid, it's an anterior dislocation, as in this case, if, if the humeral head is sitting under the acromion, it's a posterior dislocation. And this is what a hill sacs defect looks like along the posterior lateral humeral head. Remember, this is an axial image. This is anterior. This is posterior. This is medial. This is lateral. So posterior lateral, there's a defect here, right? So we lose the normal sphericity of the humeral head. It looks like, like a rat ate out a piece of this bone here, right? And so this is a hill sacs defect characteristic thing we see in an anterior glenohumeral joint dislocation. We notice that there's bone marrow edema along the lateral aspect of the humeral head from the contusion. Now we only call this along the superior aspect or the superior slices of the of the sh of the shoulder. So typically, when you can see the coracoid process of the scapula, you can see here if you it should the humeral head should be normally a sphere, but in this case we have a defect. Now as you scroll more inferiorly, there is a natural defect posterior lateral. So we never call a hill sacs lesion as we scroll inferiorly along the slice, right? Or along the image. But we only call this along the more superior slices where you can see the coracoid process of scapula. We can see the coracoid, we have a defect. So this must mean that there has been a hill sacs defect or a prior anterior glenohumeral joint dislocation. It's not currently dislocated because the humeral head is articulating well with the glenoid process of the scapula right here, right? So it's currently located, but we know that there is evidence of a prior dislocation. And a Bankart lesion on an MR you know, is best seen on a sagittal view, right? Because this is, you know, this is the, the Y of the scapula. This is the acromion here. This is part of the coracoid process. This is the glenoid. This muscle here is the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscap. So this part is anterior because we can see the lung here. This is the lung, the ribs, right? So this is subscap. So this is anterior. So this whole glenoid, right? This part is anterior. This part is posterior. This is superior. This is inferior. And if we look at the anterior inferior quadrant, which is right here, Notice that there's a lot of edema here or fluid here. Normally, the glenoid should be a nice circle. So this area should be convex bulging outward, but now it's concave bulging inward. So because we lost the convex contour of the anterior inferior glenoid, we know that there is a Bankard lesion. Not only is it a Bankard, it's an osseous Bankard because we've lost the convexity of the bone. It's concave now, right? So we know that the bone has been broken or has been contused. So this would be an osseous Bankart lesion along the anterior inferior glenoid. So I hope that was helpful in demystifying the MRI appearance of an anterior glenohumeral joint dislocation. Uh, tune in next week for another super high yield MSK unknown case. Thank you so much for your attention.